Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Lynette Roth and I'm Daimler Curator of the Bush Reisinger Museum and Head of the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums and I will be serving as our moderator for the Q&A later on. Uh, before we begin today's program, the Harvard Art Museums acknowledge that Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people and we at the university strive to honor this relationship. I want to thank you for joining this week's session of our series, Art Talks Live, which offer an up-close look at works from our collections with our team of curators, conservators, fellows, and graduate students. And uh, although many of you know this, we do meet here every other Tuesday on Zoom at 1230 for these short interactive talks. Uh, just some logistics you'll see on your screen. Please put your questions in the Q&A, which we'll do at the end of the session, although there will be a brief interactive uh, component in today's talk uh, while um, our speaker is presenting. Uh, and um, we will conclude uh, the talk at one o'clock today. So I am very pleased uh, to introduce our speaker, Joanna Seidenstein. Stanley H. Derwood Foundation Curatorial Fellow in the Division of European and American Art. And Joanna is a specialist in 17th century Dutch art, and she's working on uh, multiple projects here at the museum uh, on uh, 17th century Dutch art. And so we are very lucky to hear from her today about an intricate drawing by van der Ast called the Feathered Cone Shell. And Joanna is going to look at this object very closely to explore with us histories of global trade and colonization. And so with that, uh, I turn it over to you, Joanna. Thank you so much, Lynette. And hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. I am very excited to spend this time with you looking at and thinking about this drawing made with ink and watercolor on a sheet of paper fewer than five inches in height. This is a work you could easily hold in the palms of your hands. The work is attributed to the 17th century Dutch artist Balthazar van der Ost, as Lynette mentioned, and it depicts a seashell that is indeed off the seashore, away from anything we could call a natural setting. In fact, what we're looking at is a shell twice, even three times removed from the sea and shore, an image of a drawing of a shell that was once transported from a marine landscape in one part of the world to a very different setting in another. And that here in the drawing appears in isolation, surrounded by blank paper, marked only by the artist's monogram at lower right, and the calligraphic inscription of the name of the shell, Net Horen, as it was then known in Dutch. And we'll talk more about that later. There's nothing even to tell us the scale or size of the shell. And yet, this non-shell in this non-setting has a very strong illusion of physicality. It casts a shadow suggestive of three-dimensional space. And zooming in a little, we can see the individual brush strokes, especially along the bottom, that so vividly convey the illusion of volumetric form and a gleaming surface. So there's a tension between the vivid presence of the shell and the absence of any context. We're alone with the shell, the empty space around it insisting on a one-on-one -on -one interaction with it a feeling that is perhaps all the more pronounced as each of us views the image on our personal computers and tablets. But this drawing also, in a sense, mirrors the traditional art museum experience where we encounter individual works of art that are often removed from their original contexts, often enshrined within white walls, usually with a bit of text to ground us. On one hand, on one hand this decontextualization might allow each of us to bring our contemporary personal perspectives to the work of art. But we know that it can also have a silencing effect, insisting on a certain way of viewing an object and understanding its importance, while erasing other histories and perspectives, including the visitor's own. 
So I thought we could begin by making some space for your perspectives. If you're comfortable sharing your thoughts, I would be thrilled if you would enter into the Q&A box any words that come to mind when you look at this drawing, whether a personal association, it could be memories of beach vacations or other experiences with sea and shore. I don't know if there are any scuba divers or snorkelers in attendance, or perhaps you might wanna share a feeling that this drawing brings up for you. So it can just be a single word or a phrase or a specific experience you've had, anything that comes to mind uh, when you look at Michelle's tamed, someone says, cracked but put together again, interesting, collector, the coastline, very nice, sand and water, wonderful. Makes me think of a snail. Excellent. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that for sure. Tattoo. Oh, very interesting. Hadn't thought about seashell tattoos. A shell my brother had on his bedroom shelf when I was growing up. And that shell was isolated too. Very interesting. Porcelain. Oh, I love that. Yeah, the, the, the uh, you know, human engineered materials that uh, can often mimic natural natural ones. Smooth. Yeah. I really get that too. Tortoise shell. Yeah. Very interesting. Scientific. Great. Calm and peaceful. Lace. Nice. World travel, which I am missing recently. Indeed. Nature's perfection. Modeled. Bird's egg. Illuminated manuscripts with decorative text. Jewel. Mm, I love that. Jewel like gem light. Something small and precious. I would like to feel it in my hand, smooth, cool. I love that it evokes different senses, feeling of it in my hand. Jigsaw puzzle, so interesting. A lot of comments like that about the pattern on the shell that really does look like a puzzle or somebody said kind of crack, you know, as if it had been cracked and then put glued back together. Whimsy, figures in modeling potentially deadly. Oh, I like that. We'll, we'll definitely get to that as well. Cabinet of Curiosities reminds me of a collection of shells my dad brought back from this time in the Marshall Islands at the end of World War II. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah, but uh, it's a lot of nostalgia here, I think, for, for many of us. Hard and smooth. Yeah, I love that. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for offering these wonderful thoughts and uh, different associations and, and memories. And I, 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 was, I can share that just in preparing this talk, I remembered something that I hadn't thought about in years. And that uh, was this bunny rabbit figurine that my great grandmother made out of seashells, gluing together shells to, to form the ears and the face and the body. Um, and so craft making for me also comes to mind when I look at or think about, about shells now. For, for me, another one of the compelling things about seashells is their seeming agelessness. Shells do eventually decompose, but in stable environments, they, they last. And so when you encounter a shell in someone's collection, there's a chance that it's been in existence for hundreds of years. And fossilized shells can be hundreds of thousands of years old. So in contrast to so much of the natural world, shells endure with histories and futures that transcend our own. And as the products and domiciles of sea creatures that are known to have existed more than 30 million years ago, they also carry with them a sense of the primordial. In more recent history, let's say the last few thousand years, seashells have served human beings in many ways around the world for religious ritual, as, for, as forms of currency, as sources of pigments for paint and dye, as decorative material and inspiration, as collectibles, as some of you said, commodities in their own right. And, and as for many of us today as well, as mementos of time spent by the sea, or perhaps as some of you said, family members bringing back shells from their, their trips and sharing them with us. So now with all of that in mind, all of these 
perspectives and experiences in mind. Let's think a little bit about the original context of this drawing and this shell, what's not pictured here. And I thought to do that, we could begin by looking briefly at two works that were made in the decades leading up to this drawing. At left, a painted portrait of a Dutch shell collector, and at right, a drawing made to look like an engraving print of a Black figure who is presumed to represent one of the many enslaved people of African origin and descent whose forced labor supported the trade of seashells, among so many other things in the period. The market for beautiful seashells had long existed, but it was boosted significantly by Dutch colonial expansion in the Americas, Africa, and Asia in the 17th century. And it continued to be big business. And just as a quick aside, if you ever wondered about the name and logo of Shell Oil and its many gas stations, indeed this company, which began in the Netherlands in the mid 19th century, earned its initial wealth as a purveyor of shells from Asia. But these works are of course very different. The painting is a commissioned portrait designed to project an individual's interests and identity. The drawing a more enigmatic representation of an unidentified model that could be met, read many different ways, but was likely understood by 17th century white European audiences as an image that makes an analogy between the human being who's represented here and the shell he holds, both seen as exotic and perhaps also both as possessions. So in very different ways, these two works point explicitly to some of the human history surrounding seashells, literally to the hands that touched them, to the labor behind the harvesting, polishing, and selling of shells, and of the lives impacted by this trade, and to the consumers who purchased and prized them. The Harvard drawing does not show any of these hands. And in a gallery, this gallery where it's slated to appear next year um, with amidst portraits, head studies, landscapes, a tavern scene, a church interior. So depictions of many human figures at work, at leisure, at prayer. This might seem the least likely place to wrestle with complex human histories and the most tempting to regard as an image and not an artifact to get lost in the abstract pattern of lines on the shell's surface, and certainly to forget about the laborers, tradesmen, and consumers who are not pictured. But it too is a product of commerce and colonialism. And as an object that has survived since the 17th century, it carries those stories with it, even if they are not visibly pictured. It's also important to note that originally this drawing would not have been seen in isolation and certainly not in a museum. Rather, it formed part of an enormous series of drawings of shells and flora and fauna, believed to have comprised at least 483 sheets, all bearing the same calligraphic inscriptions indicating the name of the species pictured, and in most cases, the artist's monogram at lower right. We're fortunate to have three other drawings from this series at Harvard, but surviving sheets are found in many collections with an especially large group in the Fondacia, Fondacia Consoria in Paris. These sheets shown, shown here are all about the same size, about 12 inches in height. And based on the format and size of our drawing, less than half that height, it's likely that it was once part of a full sheet with another shell or animal sharing the space of the page. I think we see it right. In any case, that it was part of this series as a reminder of the tactile, even interactive nature of viewing drawings in the period. Infrequently framed and much more often compiled into albums, drawings were touched, held close, and probably passed around and shared with visitors offering intimate one-on-one -on -one interaction, but also a social experience, just like the shells themselves. Notably, Balthazar van der Ast lived in Middleburg, one of the intellectual hubs of the Dutch Republic, known particularly as a center for the study of natural history. 
it is likely that these drawings were made for an amateur naturalist and collector who wished to have a catalog of specimens, perhaps ones he or she owned. And like the specimens they represent, drawings like these were prized for knowledge and for their beauty. It is clear that Vondras had sustained access to many of the flowers and shells in these drawings as they appear in various paintings by the artist. And here, for example, in the tiny painting at right, even smaller than the drawing, you can see a shell that bears a strong resemblance to ours. And here blown up, but still roughly to scale, you can see there are some distinct similarities, but also differences. Whether these works depict the same shell from slightly different angles or two different shells, they have both based on their shape and pattern and to the extent that a two-dimensional representation permits any identification, referred to as examples of conus pinnaceus, or feathered cone, the shell of a species of sea snail. One of you already mentioned snails earlier. Uh, the species uh, is indigenous to the Indo-Pacific, a biogeographic region stretching from the east coast of Africa across the Indian Ocean and the western and central Pacific to Hawaii and Tahiti. These are waters and lands, notably, in which the Dutch were very active as traders and colonizers from the early 17th century, and in the case of Indonesia, extending well into the 20th. The feathered cone snail is actually just one of some 800 species of cone snails found in these waters. And I show a few here so you can see some of the different markings on their shells. And these snails happen to be among the most dangerous predatory animals on the planet. They are intensely venomous. You can get a sense here of their anatomy, specifically the harpoon with which they inject venom into their prey. And so there is a real risk in harvesting such shells, very dangerous undertaking. Though interestingly, in recent years, these snails have been harvested for a very different reason, as scientists have found ways of using their venom in extremely small quantities as an alternative painkiller to opioids. So you can see how a drawing like this connects to so many aspects of history and of our world today. And this is one of the things I love most about art history, that it is always about both past and present and always intrinsically interdisciplinary, whether it's what's depicted, the work's original purpose, how it was bought and sold, or its life since its production. We always have reason to go beyond our historical literature. And it was certainly clear from the start that this drawing would lend itself to conversations beyond our field. And so with my colleague, Erica Lawton, who is here now running things behind the scenes, uh, we made a visit to the Molecology Collection at Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology, where a curatorial associate and collection manager, Adam Baldinger, kindly showed us their remarkable holdings, including an entire drawer of Conus pinnaceus specimens. And you can see the variation within the species and both the size and patterns on the shells. And from this drawer came the beautiful feathered cone I showed you earlier. But Adam also pulled for us a drawer of a different species called Conus striatus or striated cone. You can see these have similar patterns, but with these lengthwise striations running across them. And although, as Adam observed, those striations don't appear in our drawing, there is a resemblance, especially in the less defined edges of the areas of brown, though maybe less so in shape. And since we can't know what liberties the artist took, it's ultimately an open question. And so we thought we would do a poll and see what all of you think. So Erica will uh, pull up a poll she kindly designed for us and you can weigh in and let us know if you had to identify the shell and the drawing as one or the other, which would it be feathered or striated? And remember that scale is unclear. When, other thing you might be wondering about as you look at the drawing um, is the fact that 
drawings do change over time and can change color, sometimes from black to brown. Um, but in this case, the, uh, the drawings in wonderful condition and that brown ink um, seems certainly to have to have maintained its, its tone from, from the beginning. So no, uh, no snakes in the grass is not a trick question. So getting lots of responses here. Okay, so, so far we've got 77% of you opting for feathered cone and 24%, sorry, 76% feathered cones, 24% striated cone. So definitely feathered cone in the, in the majority. Um, very interesting. Let's see, are these numbers, they seem to be same, it seems like everybody's had a chance to, to weigh in now. So, um, so very good. Thank you so much for weighing in. It's really interesting to hear everybody's uh, opinion on this. Um, of course, you'll remember that there is a name inscribed on the drawing, possibly written by the artist, possibly by the owner of the drawing, though it does seem from the placement of the shells and flowers on each page of the series that the artist knew that these inscriptions would be added. And importantly, this work was made decades before the development of the Latin nomenclature we've been using today, like Conus pinnaceus and Conus striatus, and even before many shells had any kind of standardized uh, taxonomy. The words that appear here are fairly generic, horn meaning horn, referring to the shape of the shell, and net, I recently learned, referring to the net or mesh-like pattern on the shell surface. So if you see, as we've seen, this could describe many different kinds of cone shells. But I did find a reference to a net horn in a book published in 1705. And that is one of the earliest systematic studies of shells written by a man named uh, Jorgius Rumpfius, a naturalist who lived in a Dutch settlement on the island of Ambon in what is now Indonesia, and who carried out extensive studies of the region's plants and shells, producing volumes dedicated to each. And so here it is, the reference to a yellow net horn, uh, not illustrated, unfortunately, but described as the best type of brown net shell as shown in figure number three at top here. And this shell, based on this illustration, has been identified by modern scholars as yet another species called Conus olicus, or princely cone, which has a similar pattern to the feathered cone, but is longer and at the same time has a more bulbous curving shape. Um, as a shell in, in the drawing. But you may also have noticed that on the same page of Rumpfius's book, there's another shell that looks quite similar to the drawing in both its shape and markings. Um, and this one, the author notes, it was then in the collection of another Dutch artist named Johannes Bronckhorst. And this Rumpfius calls a brown tote, simply a brown toot, another fairly generic term used in the book to refer to shells of this kind. And this illustration has been identified tentatively as a conus pinnaceus, our old friend, the feathered cone. So don't worry, I won't make you do another poll, but rather I will suggest we embrace this uncertainty about what to call our shell. Because over the course of the very long existence of such shells, they've surely had many different names, just as knowledge of them didn't begin with Rumpfius's book or Van der Aas drawing, but with the people indigenous to the shores of the Indo-Pacific. And this is where I, as a specialist of European art, have to confront my own limitations in terms of knowledge of Eastern languages, but also the way in which I've been trained to prioritize the written word over, say, oral traditions and other forms of knowledge. And to see this as an opportunity to open this drawing up to multiple perspectives and voices, especially when it goes on, on view, to fulfill the aspiration of museums as places of coming together, of sharing knowledge and experiences, a process that allows us all to see farther and wider than we otherwise would, but at the same time gets us even closer to the work of art. 
to recognize it not as an image on a screen, but as a three-dimensional object that someone made, an artifact that materially speaking comprises just pigment on paper. And that the simple tiny drawing has the capacity to conjure and tell so many big complex stories and reveal connections across time, place, and experience. To me, that is the true magic of art and the joy of the work we do, especially as we at the Harvard Art Museums seek to reframe our collection and our mission as a museum. And to conclude, for those of you interested in learning more about this subject, I highly, highly recommend this book that was just published in August. It's an absolutely beautiful and fascinating collection of essays that to me really capture this duality of macro and microcosm that shells evoke. Um, thank you, Erica, for putting um, a link to this in the chat. And Finally, my warm thanks to my colleagues and to all of you for listening and for offering your thoughts and participating in our poll. I'm looking forward now to hearing the further thoughts and questions you may have. Great, thank you so much, Joanna, for that incredible contextualization from our own associations to the historical context of Do Dutch colonialism to the Museum of Comparative Zoology. I was really, just wonderful to hear you uh, take so much inspiration from uh, this uh, drawing in the collection. And it made me wonder, you know, I forgot to mention at the outset, but you hit on that uh, at the end, you know, this was a talk that's part of our reframe series. So that's our museum wide initiative where we're really reimagining um, the work that we do and examining a lot of the difficult histories or the untold stories as your talk so beautifully demonstrated. And I was curious, how will you do that in the gallery? You mentioned this drawing will be going on view in the Dutch gallery uh, soon. How will you tell this story? Do we have work? You know, it was wonderful the juxtaposition of the, of the hands of the um, portraits that you show? Do we have work like that in the collection? Well, we don't have um, exactly a work like that, but there are various works, prints showing uh, different kinds of collectors from the period. Um, but this uh, drawing is part of a rotation that a former colleague and I put together quite, quite a while ago. Um, it was actually supposed to go up in March 2020 or, or maybe April or May 2020. Um, but the, with the delay, um, I really started thinking very differently about it and about the other drawings mm -hmm. in the rotation, other, other shells and flowers. Um, and really thinking much more deeply about the, this web of colonial history that really undergirds these kinds of representations. Um, and so it will mean writing a very new text, um, that one that focuses as much on absences as, as mm -hmm. what's present, um, but that ideally um, in the space of the gallery to solicit the feedback of our visitors, the ideas and perspectives, just as we did today, if we can find a mechanism to do that in, in the museum itself. To me, that's the, the you know, the ideal way of, uh, you know, kind of reframing um, a drawing like this and, and really allowing all these voices to, to come through um, in addition to just providing um, additional information about its history and, and the kind of, as you say, difficult histories that don't traditionally get as much space in, in museum contexts. Yeah, we don't have any questions thus far uh, in the Q&A box. A lot of praise uh, for what a wonderful storyteller you are and how um, your reframing of this object has really uh, opened it up for people. Oh, here's a question coming through um, about whether the colors in the drawing are inks or watercolor, brown, gray, yellows. So a media specific question. Yes, thank you for, um, for that question. I'll pull up the the drawings, you can see it. Yes, yeah, so it's both ink, um, brown ink, um, and um, 
uh, but but watercolor too, and you can see you're, you're noting very well that there are grays and and yellows um, uh, applied with a with a brush with a fine brush, um, and then there's opaque white watercolor too. So the white we see in some places it's the the white of the paper showing through, but in other places it's an opaque white uh, watercolor or gouache that is applied on top for that kind of extra brilliance and and sheen. It is just so wonderfully, I mean, you talked at the outset about that incredible illusion of volumetric form, but when you started putting up the images of the actual shells, um, it really drove that, that point home. We actually had a question um, about how large are the shells that you saw at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. Yes, thank you for asking that. So they, they ranged um, quite a, a bit. Um, so in some cases, there were some that were quite small, like really like about an inch in, in length. And then I think the largest we saw were probably about three, three inches. Um, so all really quite small and, you know, definitely very, very precious um, and just beautiful to, to look at. So with these, it's another question from our uh, um, from our audience whether um, the drawings you showed that these were part of a larger series were they drawn to scale? So that's a great question. Um, yes and no. Um, so there are some where um, it does seem like the drawing is you know the the motif on the sheet of paper is the actual size of the specimen, but not not in all cases or in many cases, we just, we can't know, you know, even these, sh these shells, as I just mentioned, they do come in different sizes, um, you know, the, um, depending on the, the age of the, the snail when it discarded the shell. Um, but, uh, um, so we can't really be sure. That painting I show, that tiny painting, um, I have a suspicion that those um, shells are painted precisely to scale. And so the one, mm -hmm. see if I can pull it up here, um, the shell that looks like the shell in our drawing um, would be about two inches in this, mm -hmm. you know, since it's about six and, you know, almost seven inches across, it's about, it's about two inches. Um, whereas the one in the drawing is, is three, um, over three. Um, so, um, you know, it does seem, uh, you know, you could imagine that a collector might, would want things drawn to scale, you know, for in, in drawings like this, we presume that these drawings are made you know, for, for this kind of quasi-scientific purpose, this kind of cataloging where, you know, you think like accuracy would be like no, goal number one. Um, but then often we find that that notion is challenged uh, and that artistry, you know, kind of overtakes and, and that maybe having things blown up a little bit was also kind of desirable mm. to really be able to see them um, clearly, especially as, you know, the person who owned the drawings also owned the shell and they could look at both at, at once. Well, thank you so much, Joanne. Unfortunately, we're, we're already over time. There were a couple more questions about the snails themselves, but we'll make sure that that gets passed on to you. Um, and uh, to our audience, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you also to Erica for all of the incredible um, behind the scenes work and the polls. Um, please join us in two weeks time back here on Zoom uh, for our next art talk uh, with Jeff Stewart, who is our Director of Digital Infrastructure and Emerging Technology. And he's going to look at games in the prints in our current special exhibition at the museum uh, called States of Play. And just a reminder that the museums are open. So please uh, make a reservation for a ticket and uh, come and see the collections yourself uh, in person. Uh, we are so thrilled to be able to welcome you back. And please check our website for all of our other online events happening around our special exhibitions and the continuation of this series. So thank you so much, Joanna, and thank you all to join, for joining us today.